Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Corti, partner here at House and Worth, and I would like to thank you for joining us this evening for a conversation and walkthrough of Rita Ackerman. Mama 20, currently on view at our gallery in Zurich with artist Rita Ackerman and Johnny Jetzer, independent curator and curator at large at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculptural Garden in Washington. In this exhibition, Rita Ackerman presents her latest body of work, a continuation of her MAMA series consisting of automatic drawings and paintings on canvas which reveal her persisting interrogation of line, color and form. We will be lucky to hear more about the making of these works in the conversation tonight. This digital event is closed captioned. Should you wish to utilize this function, simply click the closed captioning icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Rita and Johnny will also take questions at the end of the event. If you wish to submit the question, please do so using the Q&A icon. Thank you again for joining us. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you artist Rita Ackerman and curator Johnny Jetzer. Hello, everyone. I'm Johnny Jetzer, an independent curator in Zurich. And I'm standing in the MAMA show, MAMA 20, by Rita Ackerman. Rita, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Hello, Johnny. How are you? Good, how are you? It's great to see you again. I mean, I know where you are because I visited you physically in your studio before. So you have a wonderful studio in, in Williamsburg where you work uh, on, on a daily base. Uh, you also have a studio cat. We saw the studio cat in the introduction film, Smokey, quite a star. And I'm very pleased to collapse two realities to do kind of a, a very short uh, studio inside, but at once to look at, together at your show, Mama, here in Zurich, and to offer a walkthrough. It's kind of a, a new step in technology that you can do that, and I'm really excited to do it with you. So maybe you can tell us just a little bit what you are working on these days. Um, so I am working uh, in Brook, I mean Bushwick studio right now, and the film what we saw it was uh, actually upstate New York, uh, where we are building a, a studio, and I can't work there right now because um, because the inside is being under construction. So uh, yeah, the summer working and the fall working in Brooklyn is very different. Um, even if I brought, I think, a lot of energy from the summer into this full series of paintings. Um, yeah, that, that explosive energy, what I had in the paintings, what you see uh, in Zurich, uh, it's kind of, I guess it's kind of tempering off. <laughs> now, I also work when I, um, when I make my drawings on the, for the paintings, uh, I work uh, simultaneously on books. And this is now a, a series of five books I will show you. Um, which is going to be published by uh, a friend of mine's publishing um, company called American Fine. American art catalog, sorry. And I have five of these really beautifully made books. Oh, no, it's going to be backward, which I fill up. And then once I fill them up, we're going to publish them just like a, an original sketchbook, it will look like. And uh, so what we are looking at right now are all original drawings, gouaches that you paint directly them, into the book. Exactly. Most of them actually oil and... Uh, that China marker, what I use for the paintings. So they are- Obviously you cannot tear out the page. So, and they look all like, like stunning sketches and work. So how does it feel, you know, to know that you're just working on a series where you have to kind of make something relevant on every page. I mean, there's no way to go back, you know, or to neutralize what you've done. Uh... I just start another page. <laughs> I don't go back. I, I put everything down and that's similar to my paintings, you know, that 
I put everything down and I erase uh, or I scrape, scrape and erase. Yeah, and then here is another one where it's almost like a painting is coming through the book. And then you, we you live since almost 30 years in New York City. And oh, yeah. I think drawing is a medium that, that was with you since the beginning. And my, my first paintings were, yes, were most of them were just large drawings, really, ink uh, on raw canvas. That's how my first, very first painting started. And um, the drawing just stayed with me, yes. The intimacy of the book, you know, and of the smaller drawing, is that something that is to be seen in relationship with the lockdown or the isolation that we all experienced in 2020? I spoke to a lot of artists who told me it didn't feel right, you know, to, to work large, especially in the beginning of the lockdown. And I feel urged to go to smaller formats and to, to have a more intimate work. Uh, Does that make sense to yeah, you? Uh, um, I was working on these books actually before the lockdown, but it was um, it was a good three months that I could not get to my studio, and I didn't have studio, so these books became a much more you know intense experience. So then uh, I started working on larger uh, works on paper as well, but uh, yeah, I. I have to say also that these books were really my survival uh, practice. So let's dive into your show. There are seven mama paintings in total, as well as works on paper. And we're going to speak about several words here. So the first painting in the show, when you enter to the right, is entitled Mama Brut. All the paintings are from 2020, as the title suggests. And it's really interesting. I think the first time I saw a mama painting, uh, you really challenged me because I know you work well and I know you work since decades. And I was really surprised by the explosion of colors, the grade of abstraction. And uh, it took me some time and it took me also the research to write an essay to to better understand the MAMA series and, and to really appreciate uh, how interesting those paintings are. So maybe we could start with MAMA all together. It's a series that started in 2018. So it's ongoing since two years. And you told me it, that's almost like a MAMA spirit or we, we said also MAMA voodoo that you send off this MAMA title actually with a, with a certain intention. Can you speak a little bit about this? Um, I spoke uh, in interviews about, you know, how I started my daily uh, practice or daily painting or working routine in the studio. It's usually I get here and I call my mother because the six hours difference in Europe and uh, I have to call her before she goes to bed. So I have this thing every morning that I talk to my mom, you know, checking on her and we tell each other, you know, just what's going on in life. And then it's a very freestyle conversation. You just never know what you <laughs> end up talking about. And, um, and when I started this series, it was coming right after a very restricted, uh, more conceptual uh, body of work, which were the chalkboard paintings. And then there was so much restriction in those works that these mama uh, paintings, how they started developing first as just uh, uh, patches of um, of a color palette, right? Just on the floor, uh, not paying attention to what's developing on the canvas, trying to um, separate myself or criticize myself uh, with with you know finishing a painting. So I felt that it's these paintings were just sort of the freedom, the ticket out from this restrictive, restricted uh, body of work, the chalkboard paintings. And uh, I put the two things together that this freestyle, you know, conversations with mom every morning and then the, the new frequencies, uh, frequency of freedom of the mama paintings. Uh, I felt like, why don't I just uh, tribute this serious to my mother? 
So that's how it was. And it goes even further. I mean, of course, it's quite ambivalent, the root of those paintings. And I think another fact that is quite interesting is that there's uh, an element of chance in the creation of these paintings. It was so interesting when you told me that when you did the first MoMA painting in 2018, actually the abstract pattern was not a willful um, kind of act, but rather almost an accident, but an accident that you triggered conceptually. Can you tell us about the first uh, way to, when you created a MoMA painting? Uh, yeah, as I said that they, the first memo paintings were more just palette paintings and I had large drawings um, on canvas and um, and I was considering doing just raw canvas drawings, go back to that original, the very beginning of my own uh, over with the raw canvas and the uh, ink drawings or raw canvas and uh, China marker drawings or pastel or oil stick drawings. And uh, and then I use these drawings, canvas drawings on canvas. I use them as palettes for um, painting all paintings in, in, in my studio. And I was working, I think, on, around that time another series, uh, which was already uh, a series of all paintings, um, sort of coming my way out from the chalkboard paintings. And so I was not paying attention uh, to the palette. I was just drawing, you know throwing down oil paint and mixing on the canvas, on the actual painting. And then when I lifted up, I saw those, you know, grandiose accidents, how they formed uh, in the center of the painting, these cows that uh, with one or two finishing strokes, it made a complete success, you know, for myself. <laughs> for myself. And uh, that's when I started so understanding that this could be a great new series uh, for me. When we look at the, the range of color, the palette of colors, and still there are a lot of recalls, you know, of art historical uh, precursors, paintings. I know that for a certain time you looked into, into the cobra painters. Uh, I know also that you, you studied at depth with them, the Kooning's painting practice, and even painters of the 19th century. How, how do you describe this, this revisiting process? And is it just like, like reading, you know, the, the painterly mastership of these older colleagues and then, then uh, building it in or challenging it by your own paintings? Oh, I think uh, it was, my, um, you know, since I, I have been uh, looking at art and considering um, to be an artist or wanting to be an artist, it was a very important part of my education also uh, at the Budapest Academy that, uh, and I, I believe in every painter's life, that's very important to study um, masters and study uh, masters in a way that why do they speak to uh, you or, or the person, uh, or why do their work speak to the audience? So these two things are always interesting for me since I, I know my, uh, my, my mind or, or my curiosities. Um, the first influence was Van Gogh and Van Gogh is still a very strong influence in my work. I still have to look at Van Gogh once in a while and go to the Metropolitan Museum and then you know, on the side of Van Gogh, I discovered Emily Bernard, uh, Emil Bernard, uh, who, who was Van Gogh and Gauguin's influence uh, back in the 19th century. And, and then the, this little discovery then took me to a whole new route in, uh, in this very, you know, contemporary paintings that I make. So, Yeah, it's, it's, it's just as a, a, an interesting, curious path how inspirations come. But uh, when I studied at the Hungarian uh, Fine Art Academy, we were looking around that time, we were looking at Cobra, we were looking at the Viennese uh, Arno Freiner and uh, the, the wild uh, groups of uh, Nietzsche and uh, 
performance painting and then also um, we were looking at or I was looking at Sheila's work and Kokoschka's work and I feel that that's still in my work so these influences they really never go away they are just sort of layers and layers and layers um, in in the work and then can be uh, revisited and then at the same time we were looking at uh, American abstract expressionism and my very uh, favorites were Klein and Kooning and uh, later on I, I discovered for myself Beth Steer and I think she was the reason uh, when I saw her work that I really wanted to come to New York to work you know in that 80s um, atmosphere of painting what I saw her work in, in a magazine and, and then she really spoke to me, that freedom, how she paints, uh, really spoke to me. And how about uh, the figurative painting from the late 70s, uh, early 80s in New York, like the whole New Expressionist painters? I mean, it's interesting to think that you arrived in New York in the early 90s, mm -hmm. where figuration was kind of maybe nowhere to be seen. I mean, it was a time when, when Matthew Barney uh, started to, to do his whole cream acid series and where like uh, some cultural wars were going on. And it's also interesting to, to remember that you started actually um, on the Lower East Side working on, on any opportunity that you could have to have a show. You also I remember did the stained glass windows at Max Fish, the legendary bar. And uh, then you, you slowly uh, got a studio on 42nd Street. But I think it's really uh, impressive how uh, over the course of 30 years, how you developed a work that started off with figuration and still contains this figuration today, but also challenges this figuration. Maybe you can also speak a little bit about this whole remix process of your own work that started off in these past years. So uh, as I was saying that, you know, when I was studying at the Hungarian Fine Art Academy that it was such a conservative classical school, uh, the, the figurative drawing and painting was, was a, a very important you know, you had to learn how to, how to do that masterfully. So when I arrived to New York, I was just so happy because when, when I was, you know, working there, all that we wanted to do is painting abstract. All we, I saw, you know, in my own uh, art practice there on the academy, all I did was just looking at Klein, Franz Klein, you know, how to make abstract paintings and, and Kooning and, uh, when I arrived to New York, uh, uh, I felt that, you know, I, I was at the New York Studio School for a year and um, there were the, the two different uh, influences there. There was the conservatives were actually the abstract expressionists uh, and then the, the sort of pop voice was, was not quite popular there uh, because uh, uh, New York Studio School was standing for the old uh, classical values of the uh, of the of the American abstract expressionism. Even if we were able to, you know, do the figurative drawings um, and uh, work after model, uh, it was still a pretty conservative uh, school. So my interest was immediately what what would be the opposite, and that would that would be the pop uh, the pop art. Uh, scene and uh, and as a very young person I also just wanted to make friends and find um, uh, find find artists who think uh, similarly I, I do and as you said yeah the the downtown scene the Lower East Side the downtown New York around the early 90s was very vibrant and uh, um, it was just everything was possible. You could be in one day, you could really change your life and um, able to, you know, meet with the right people who would introduce you to uh, 
some studios or exhibitions. So I, I was lucky enough to meet some friends who, who helped me to get a studio on 42nd Street and then meet other friends who were able to help me to get my drawings uh, uh, into little shops uh, on T-shirts so I could make money and, uh, you know, start working freely on my art. So, and, you know, I would... Once you ended up designing the cover of Thurston Moore's solo album, maybe you can tell the anecdote how you, you met Thurston in New York. I, just, I met Thurston because I was uh, working in the new museum window painting uh, the stained glass window there. Um, I think it was Marsha Tucker who uh, curated me into that window, um, thanks to her. And uh, yeah, that was my very first big gig in New York, the new museum window on Broadway. And uh, even today I hear from friends, like, you know, that window really made me want to come to New York. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was a special moment. If you look at the painting style back then, it was very much uh, based on a graphic line. Actually, the, the line was black and, and made from, from liquid color. When we look at this, all these new series of, of paintings, like even this study number 13, Mama study number 13, also from 2020, we saw actually that now you often use a, like a line that is very much modulated and that is much more uh, making references to the 19th century when there's much more expressive. So actually we see a, a, a highly vivid line. I think the early paintings were recalling to a certain degree also cartoons, maybe to a certain extent, but also Fernand Léger with this uh, separation of outline and, and, and uh, coloration. Now we have a completely new level of expressivity in the drawing. And it's really interesting to see that. Is that something that happened suddenly or how, that, how, how that came this along? Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, was, I was so lucky that I just listened to uh, the, the Philip Guston, um, the book of, uh, of Robert Storr, what he wrote uh, on Guston and, and Fang Boy had a great conversation going through all the work. And, um, and Robert Storr uh, quoted, uh, I forgot the name of a French thinker who said that the hand knows things what the mind doesn't know. And I 100% believe that in my work that my hand always draws and it has been drawing, drawing, drawing and knows much more than I do know about my own work. So um, for me, these figurative drawings, they really do not mean anything. Maybe back uh, 25, 27 years ago when I first started drawing these female figures, um, I was going to express emotions with the figure, but uh, not, that's not the case anymore. Uh, it's, they became uh, the rehearsed figures, what they really deliver me to a next level, or not me, the painting to a next level where uh, they know more than I do. Does that make sense? I'm not sure. It does make sense. It does make sense. But I, th I think it's also very interesting. Maybe you can speak briefly about a, a little bit more in depth, this idea of, of the mama a title. I think what is, what is really interesting is, I mean, the biographical aspect that you explained before on one hand, but on the other hand, also the whole, the whole idea of mothership and the whole idea of creation. And I think as a female painter, it is very important, I guess, to stress also the intellectual approach, the conceptual approach of your work. Mm -hmm. And what we see here in the background is, is also a painting, one of the seven paintings, Tanks and Queens. And what you see really well in this painting is also how you operate with void or almost a type of erasure, which I, I really like and which really triggers something in me because you at some time seem to 
almost vandalize your own work. I mean, in, a, in the earlier chalk series, the chalk paintings, you were just eradicating the line and you would make it disappear. And uh, now in these paintings, you have the drawing that is smudged by the color and that almost disappears in the background. And, and I think this is one of the, of the great qualities of this MAMA series is that different systems of representation compete with each other. So for me, there's a very strong conceptual core also behind these paintings. Yeah, uh, what you said about, you know, that the erase, uh, erasing and, and uh, making things disappear on the surface. Uh, when I was doing the chalkboard paintings, what interested me that the, the more I erase a line, uh, that line actually gets engraved into the surface, into the... Um, you say that uh, into that texture of the surface. So it's, it's almost uh, uh, this weird um, oxymoron happens that more you erase uh, the intense, so the, the, the presence of, uh, of, of, of something, a figure or a, or a shape appears. So in these paintings, I think that, that somehow you can, it resonates back from the chalkboard paintings that the line can be erased and then those erased lines uh, are almost the most present ones on the painting because it's just curious what is behind uh, a certain stain or what is what I am trying to erase. It's always more curious than what is so much in your face. Um, and what you said about, uh, you know, the, the um, subject matter of uh, of this of this drawing so these figures or these childhood almost childhood drawings that uh, it's not really uh, the mothership it's more about that kind of feeling of safety of the fairy tales that i think we all you know grow up for a reason with with fairy tales and then some of them really stick with you uh, and i find it very important um uh, in contemporary art to, to represent those childhood fairy tales, what, uh, what really became like almost an anthem of my life. You know, for, for me, the Andersen fairy tales were, and, and the illustrations of Andersen fairy tales by, uh, actually the, the illustrator was uh, Andersen, her last name was Andersen too, just I forgot her first name. They were very significant, um, memories that made me an artist. Let's move on to the fifth painting that, or the fifth work in the exhibition that we're gonna visit. It's the last one in the chronology of the exhibition. And it's entitled Skirt on Fire. I think you can really feel the, the energy of the fire and uh, I think it would be interesting to hear a little bit more about the act of painting. And uh, you use this term of intuition in regards of, of the act of painting and how you, you create this painting. And I think it's just important to stress the difference between abstract expressionism that is kind of a, a willful expression and also maybe to a certain degree a competition and your approach to, to these abstract paintings or the abstract part of the painting? Oh, I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know the intuition is a, the right word to say. I, I would much more say that, you know, just um, when I paint um, these paintings, I, I really don't have a, a an exact, I, I, I'm, all I have to be is, is there in the studio and, and just get into the right position and then, then it happens. And, and I, I don't think so it's an intuition or I'm searching something in myself to find that, that state of mind to, to, to make the work. It's really, um, 
it, I would just say it just really comes through me, uh, but it's, it's not my, um, uh, uh, it's, it, it, it's really, it's not something I, I accomplish. It's the, it, the painting accomplished itself. I, I would say that. A place that uh, played a major role in also in the creation of a, a whole new phase in your work was this residency you had in Marfa, Texas. Mm -hmm. And on one hand, of course, it was the experience of the desert, the experience also of of the art that is exhibited there, such as John Chamberlain. And uh, I read an interview that you said that where you say at a certain point my brutal side exploded. Can you tell us a little bit more about this Marfa experience and, and how it influenced your work? Mm -hmm. uh, Marfa, yeah, it's, I was just having a, with a friend last night this conversation about location and how much location matters uh, when, you, when you paint from inside. So, um, for me, the Marfa experience was that very first experience. Uh, then there was just nothing else. There was no friends, city, circumstances, nothing. Just uh, just the vast land and, um, and then this building where I could paint. Um, and it was almost like a kind of monastic experience. Um, because uh, I was there in 2009 when when the when Morpha was not so popular yet, so it was it was really there was no distraction whatsoever, and uh, and um, yeah, I got I guess I uh, hmm, I guess I got kind of uh, yeah I. I sort of just get to a, a next level with myself and, and uh, what, yeah, what the path I would like to take with uh, my paintings. But you, all, you also refer to a book that you read while you were in Marfa, mm -hmm. where basically an author rewrites the same story in 99 different versions. Oh, uh, that book I actually, uh, uh, yeah, um, we are talking about uh, the Dada book, um, the style exercise, right? Uh, right. Raymond, yeah, exactly, Raymond Kuno. Um, I don't know how that uh, how that uh, book related uh, to the Marfa paintings. Um, you know what I really what was really great in Marfa. Um, just sort of observing that kind of uh, uh, organized chaos in the backyards of uh, uh, of the country, and then this vast uh, Texan um, small town villages or ghost towns, and and then going around and taking photographs of uh, that de de decay. What you know how nature uh, sort of grew together with. Uh, with civilization and then all these cars and uh, just a uh, lot of junk so beautifully organi organizing itself into some, um, you know, grandiose failure, um, as uh, I mentioned that earlier. And uh, somehow th those imagery of the photographs, what I was taking, uh, in Marfa, they, they related very closely to, to the paintings. And then of course, as uh, we spoke about earlier, the Chamberlain sculptures, those crumbled up uh, cars, which was, looked like a, a, a bull, but a, a monster is kicking around, right? Those just like metal balls of junk. Um, interestingly, maybe now you can see those uh, in these MoMA paintings because that kind of giant chaos uh, getting organized on the, on the canvas into harmony. You once uh, said to me jokingly, oh, I'm, I'm not a, a good mama. I wasn't a good mama to my paintings. 
and they're going to have a good life after me. And I, I, I mean, it made me a little bit sad, I must say, but on the other hand, I think it's true that paintings have a, a lifespan that is much longer, that can be much longer than, than a human lifespan. And uh, like, how, how does it feel? You know, for example, I mean, the show here, Mama 20 in Zurich, you weren't able to travel and you had to give the instruction and you kind of release these paintings and you, you give, you hand them over to other people. They get exhibited, they get sold. Can you tell us a little bit more about this relationship that you have with the paintings and how they detach themselves also from you and become almost like personality on their own? Uh, I think that's just, that's just the point. And, um, I find the paintings much more interesting than humans. <laughs> I mean, especially, I, I, I think uh, it's, uh, humans are very interesting, but if, uh, if a painter uh, as a person more interesting than, than the painting is, uh, or can, uh, can add more to the painting than the painting can carry itself, right? then there is something wrong there. I feel that I, I, I just make an excuse to myself, basically, that I'm not uh, able to talk about my paintings uh, better than they do speak for themselves. And, uh, and it was actually for me to, 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 to say the truth, it's better for me not to be uh, on an opening and um, uh, answer questions, but just have the work there and just come take the take its uh, take its stand, and um, hopefully that's. But also in history, you know what it does. Then I cannot distract anymore with my humanness, uh, the the viewer or the audience. I cannot distract with me uh, from really looking at the painting, that what, what they are about, and then everybody can uh, make their own story for it or, you know. Start yeah, on fire. How did you pick the name and, and when does the title come to your mind? Uh, skirt on fire. Um, I just, you know, um, there is no way to make a painting for me, uh, a manifestation before I make the painting. I can't really tell what this painting is gonna look like. So uh, the painting just develops in front of me and then, then I start seeing things in it and that's how the title Skirt on Fire uh, happened that I saw a skirt on fire in the painting and then I just titled it Skirt on Fire. One of the most difficult things, it seems, is to know when to stop the painting, when it's accomplished, basically. Do you have any, any rituals, you know, to know and to test the ground and to know when, when a painting is accomplished? Um, it's every single painting is different. I, um, it's... Um, <laughs> To come. I, I, I really can't answer that. It's just every single, I start a new painting today and I have no idea why and how it's going to be accomplished, but it will be accomplished if it can leave the studio. Uh, as long as it's uh, not ready to leave the studio, it's not accomplished. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, visual, it's a visual phenomenon. Or yeah. maybe to ask my question in a different way, has it happened that you overdid a painting and that you thought, oh, maybe I should have stopped before or maybe it's not the same painting as the one that I intended to do? 100%, 100%. You can kill a painting and you can give a life <laughs> to the painting by finishing it at the right time. And then also you can make one wrong move and uh, it's unfortunately dead. Rita, thank you so much for sharing all the, the, those insights. And uh, I see we have at least four questions. 
So I will read them aloud. Julia is asking, hi, I wanted to ask you, you did the lockdown have any positive impact of slowing down the pace that the rush for the show, for galleries, for museum and private orders could allow for you to stop and catch your breath? Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the question, Julia. Um, I do not have rush ever. No, <laughs> it's not, not that uh, the demand, uh, I really, uh, I, I guess I, I never um, I never can rush myself, so I just go with my own space. And the quarantine was a was a good thing for I think it's just more that just uh, looking to ourselves. But I think it was good for everybody that you know just sort of re um, it, it was it was a good way to uh, reappreciate everything uh, if of something in life is not noticed because of the rush or not appreciated. So I, I did not um, experience um, a, cha a change of space because if I, if I feel slow, slowing down in the studio and taking a, a week of just drawings uh, and not painting or, uh, or a painting I cannot finish because it's just not coming to its end for some reason, um, I just have to practice patience. Thank you. The next question is by Sarah. A few inter interrelated questions. How important is mystery to you? Is it important that the paintings are unknowable to the viewer? Is it important that the paintings are unknowable to you? I think you partly answered that, but I think it would be interesting to hear more about it. Uh, I can just talk for myself that uh, um, every time I start a, a new work, uh, I'm starting it because it's, it's, a, it's another ve uh, venture into the unknown. And if that would be not into the unknown, if I would uh, know what is going to happen and I'm not able to uh, see something what I have never seen before, then I, I would actually not be interested in start a painting. So would you say mystery is important to you? Uh, I think the unknown and mystery uh, might be not the exact same thing, but uh, it's, I mean, we don't, when you get up, you don't know what is going to happen exactly that day, right? You know, uh, certainly you, you almost like a painting, you can have your, the, the materials and the medium um, and, and the dimensions uh, figured out ahead of time, but the rest is, is, is going to be somewhat unknown. I mean, for, I'm talking for my own practice. So that's very important that I, I keep that freedom. Thank you. The next question comes from Stefan or Steven. What determines how much abstraction versus figuration is in the works? Do you attempt to get it less figurative or the other way around typically? Oh, so when I, when I use figuration um, in the work, um, it's really just if it bothers me, it's, if it starts bothering me that I see, much, I see too much the figure and that figure is too present, then I, I uh, tend to push the work toward more abstraction. But then there are times when the figure does not bother me and then it can stay. So then, then it's sort of the figure becomes a little more present and then, then not, not saying sitting on the top of the abstract, abstraction, but more, it's, I, I, I feel that that's how the, the painting is, is uh, finding itself to, to the finish that the figure is more present. Thank you. Hi, Rita. It's from Ingrid. Hi, Rita and Johnny. Loving this conversation and the work. Where has the MAMA series taken you and what are you exploring now? Um, the MAMA series is taking shapes, different shapes, uh, uh, but there is really uh, hard to, uh, it is really hard to um, say anything concrete while I'm working. I think uh, I need another uh, 
good year into the series that I will be able to manifest uh, about the, the works. Has it triggered any new complex of works that might rise out of the MoMA series? I mean, the work itself is uh, <laughs> what I, 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 I think that MoMA series is just everything what i have done before and after i don't know really i can't as i said that i just let it be the you know the exploration of the unknown i mean that covers pretty much the question of heiner thank you heiner for your question regarding the future and we have julia's question i wanted to ask who are the heroes on your painting who are the heroes Oh, yes. oh, 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 interesting. Um, I do not uh, really, um, I think I'm, uh, uh, my, my, my heroes, you mean the figurative uh, elements, uh, uh, heroes? Or, it says uh, the heroes on the painting. So those will be the heroes living in the painting rather than than the heroes, the painter heroes for you. Oh, who are the painter heroes? Or are there any heroic figures within the paintings? Uh, maybe not, no. Okay, let's move on. The questions still are coming in from Sasha. You mentioned your paintings were a form of freedom of expression. Do you ever overthink the process of making when creating? If so, how do you overcome this? I think we spoke about that. Mm -hmm. Then Mara, how did you manage to overcome the fact that maybe some people did not agree with your art? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think it's, um, you know, I think that's just going to happen. You know, I, I think I do make a work what is uh, either liked or disliked. It's, it's, it's not a gray area for sure. And I like that. If somebody dislikes my work, that, uh, that is just as fine as, not, not just as fine. I mean, of course, makes me happy uh, if uh, the work is well received. Um, I was much more disturbed when I was younger at what, you know, the criticism of my work and I was going to listen to it and learn from it. And I'm sure I still, um, read when I get um, critical thoughts, but um, I think um, I passed, passed uh, paying too much attention when it's negative criticism. Thank you. Stefan is, wants to know, do you listen to music while painting or are you working in pure silence? Oh yeah, I love, love listening music and my latest uh, studio, uh, Listening is is uh, Bob Dylan has this amazing series called the Theme Time Radio Hours, and so he comes up uh, with this uh, absolutely genius, marvelous uh, radio DJing um, songs uh, by by a theme. So he, he comes up with a theme like the eyes or or whiskey or uh, night or the moon and so he just organizes a list of amazing songs and gives a great historical references to the to the the artist and the song so that's my very favorite studio listening right now in this in these days nice yeah i can send it to you johnny <laughs> yes please lisa asks how do you approach the blank canvas? I think we go back to the origins. Uh, just like a child approaches uh, a white paper, just uh, full of excitement, full of, uh, 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 full of possibility, the feeling of um, just overcoming joy that, oh, I got this and I can do anything what I want. Thank you. And the last one, Amelie wants to know, does that music, so I guess it's Bob Dylan, affect your painting process? 
Uh, yeah, right now, Bob Dylan, uh, summer when I was making uh, the MoMA series for Zurich, it was uh, Bob Dylan, this one song, especially uh, I listened over and over and over on repeat. It's called, uh, if dogs run free, why not we? I think it's a beautiful last quote for this conversation. I thank you so much, Rita, for your time and dedication and for sharing your, these insights into your paintings and the process behind them. And I thank also all the viewers worldwide for being with us this hour. So just to repeat for those who came late, I was here in Zurich at Löwenbreit Hausen Wirt in the show Mama 20 by Rita Ackermann while Rita Ackermann is in her studio in Williamsburg, New York. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Hopefully have a nice weekend. Thank you. Bye, Rita. Thanks, Take John. Care. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>